Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome here in the Rotonde Bertouille in Bozar at uh, um, what will become one of the most interesting encounters of today, I'm sure. Um, I am Karl van den Broek, I work for Bozar, and um, it's my pleasure to have Orlando Fajis here together with us in Bozar. Um, why is he here? Well, it's self-evident when Ladies I saw his book, uh, Europeans, welcome here Three Lives and the Making of a Cosmopolitan and, uh, Culture. I said, okay, um, we have Europe, what we have culture. So that ticked two boxes that is, are very relevant for Bozar and for European Lab. Then I started reading the book and I, uh, it was even more uh, convenient to uh, have him here and I will let him explain that by reading a fragment of his book before. Orlando Fajs is a British uh, historian. I knew him from his work on Russia. He wrote a lot of books on Russia, who are, I can all, all recommend you. But now his scope is much broader, but still Russia, and especially one Russian, Ivan Turgenev, plays a very crucial role in your book. But it's very convenient, it's, it's even, um, poetic that we are here in Brussels, because your book starts not in Brussels, but in Paris, with the train going from Paris to Brussels. Could you just read that fragment and then you will all understand where this conversation will be going? Um, yes, I can with pleasure, Frank. Is this microphone working? Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, let me just read from the very beginning of the book, the introduction, and then perhaps the significance of Brussels will become clearer, if I can find the beginning. The first steam engine pulled out of the Gare Saint-Lazare on its pioneering journey to Brussels at 7.30 in the morning on a sunny Saturday, 13th of June, 1846. Two more locomotives followed it in sequence while the crowd cheered and the band played to send them on their way. Each of the three trains was made up of 20 open carriages decked out in the French and Belgian tricolore. Their 1,500 passengers had been invited by Baron James de Rothschild to celebrate the opening of the Paris-Brussels railway, which his company, the Chemin de Fer du Nord, had recently completed with the building of the line from the French capital to Lille. It was not the first international railway. Three years earlier, in 1843, the Belgians had inaugurated a railroad from Antwerp to Cologne in Prussia's Rhine province. But the Paris-Brussels line was especially important because it opened up a high-speed connection linking France and the Low Countries, Britain via Ostend or Dunkirk, and the German-speaking lands. The French press heralded the new railway as the beginning of Europe's unification under the cultural dominance of France. Inviting foreigners to see our art, our institutions, and all that makes us great is the surest way to maintain the good opinion of our country in Europe, reasoned the commission that approved the building of the line to Lille. The first train carried the official dignitaries, the Duc de Nemours and Montpensier, sons of the French king, accompanied by French and Belgian ministers, police chiefs, and various celebrities. In, among them, the writers Alexandre Dumas, Victor Hugo, and Théophile Gautier, as well as the painter Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. Traveling from Paris at the unheard of speed of 30 kilometers per hour, the advance party reached Lille in the sweltering heat of the afternoon. With their wind-swept hair and fine clothes covered in dust from the open-air journey, the travellers descended at a temporary station outside the medieval walls where they were met by the city's leaders, the Archbishop of Cambrai and a mounted guard of honour bearing French and Belgian flags. After the playing of the national anthems by a military band, the dignitaries walked in procession through the decorated streets where such large crowds had assembled that the National Guard struggled to maintain order. Thieves were everywhere. There were scenes of chaos when the drinks ran out and alarms were raised as a fire broke out in the Palace of Justice. The festivities began with a magnificent banquet given by Rothschild for 2,000 people, 
in a vast marquee on the site of the future railway station, at that time being built inside the medieval walls. 60 cooks and 400 waiters served up generous helpings of poached salmon in white sauce, York ham with fruits, quail au gratin, partridges à la régence, creamed beans, cheeses, desserts and French wine, whereupon the toast began. To the unity of France and Belgium, to international peace, Rothschild made a heartfelt speech about the railways bringing Europe's nations together. As evening drew in, there was a monster concert on the Esplanade where Berlioz conducted the first performance of his Grand Symphonie Funèbre et Triomphale by 400 bandsmen from the local garrisons. The organizers had insisted on adding 12 cannons to the orchestra, which were meant to fire on the final chords of the apotheosis. But when the moment came, they could not be fired because the lighters had been lost although two were lit with a cigar, which caused their fuses to fizzle in the air, fooling some of the audience into thinking that had been intended all along. At two o'clock in the morning, the convoy of revelers continued on their journey to Brussels. At Kortrijk, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Kortrijk, yep. Thank you. The first Belgian town. The whole population appeared at the station to greet the extraordinary trains from France. At Ghent, there was a military parade with a cannonade. For the last stretch of the route from Mechelen, the front two trains progressed in parallel, entering the station in Brussels to cheers from the assembled crowd at the same time. The French princes were received on the platform by Leopold, the Belgian king, and his French wife, Louise of Orléans, the, the prince's elder sister. There was a banquet in the Grand Palace and a ball given by the Belgian railways in the newly opened Gare du Nord. The station was converted into a ballroom by constructing a wooden floor above the tracks, suspending chandeliers from the glass roof and importing tulips by the wagon load from Holland. We have never seen a ball as magnificent as this, claimed the correspondent of Le National. In the early hours of the next morning, the visitors from France began their return to Paris. The 330-kilometer journey took just 12 hours, a quarter of the time it usually required to make the trip by stagecoach, the fastest mode of transport before the railway. Soon, national boundaries were being crossed by railways everywhere. A new era for European culture had begun. Artists and their works could now move around the continent much more freely. Berlioz would travel on the line from Paris to Brussels on his way to Russia for a concert tour in 1847. At that time, he could only get as far as Berlin by railway, but on his second tour of Russia 20 years later, he could travel all the way from Paris to St. Petersburg by train. From these decades, the railways would be used by orchestras and choirs, opera and theatre companies, touring exhibitions of artistic works and writers on reading tours. The formidable weight of many artistic enterprises, which would have required incredible number of horses and carriages, was relatively effortlessly moved by steam power. An international market would be opened for the cheap mass reproduction of paintings, books, and sheet music. The modern age of foreign travel would begin, enabling Europeans in much greater numbers to recognize their commonalities. It allowed them to discover in these works of art their own Europeanness, the values and ideas they shared with other peoples across Europe, above and beyond their separate nationalities. So, I think it's clear why we have Orlando Fages here in, uh, in Brussels today. Um, the central uh, thesis of your book is, in fact, that through this technology, and it's not only the train, but also mass media, the fact that you could easily print sheet music and, and uh, uh, multiply uh, so people could play the, the, the 
the music, the, the compositions immediately after they were composed, but also the cheap uh, reproduction of, of, uh, plast world of plastic art, paintings, etc., through engravings, made that um, the market for culture became much more big, much bigger, and that artists could become economically independent from kings or patrons, etc. Um, so, and that therefore, at the end, through this evolution, at the end of the 19th century, basically everyone in Europe was listening to the same music, looking at the same paintings, just going to the same theater plays and operas. Um, it was a revolution, in fact, but what was the main element in, in, the, in this revolution? Was it the, the train or was it just this combination of all these factors? I, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good summary of <laughs> the thesis. Um, no, thank you. I, I think it's the combination of three absolutely essential technologies within the emerging capitalist or market system. The railways, obviously. Um, lithography, you've mentioned, is a revolution in printing which enables cheap mass reproduction and indeed increasingly to be able, uh, uh, enabling printers to put pictures beside print. Um, and also musical publications were revolutionized by lithography. So cheap reproduction on a mass basis becomes possible, easily distributed by railways. And then the third, often neglected, really important um, element of the 19th century is copyright. Which actually is another reason to be in Belgium, because Belgium was the capital of piracy. Yeah. There were well over 200 pirate publishers estimated to be operating out of Brussels alone mm -hmm. and importing cheap books um, into France for the French-speaking market. Um, although it was here in Brussels in 1858 that the first Congress or organized by writers and publishers to try and get international copyright established took place. Obviously, in the end, it was the Bern Convention of 1886, signed by 10 powers that enabled that, but it's the, it's the fact of copyright that enables, as you say, um, composers, artists, uh, writers to make money out of mass reproduction of their works mm -hmm. in a way that had not been possible before. Well, in your book, you have the title is not for nothing, Three Lives and the Making of Cosmopolitan Culture. It's about three marvelous people. It's like, you have, on the one hand, the well-known Russian writer Ivan Turgenev, who we all know. People who know the opera also know Pauline um, Viardot. Viardot and her husband, Louis. They had this strange menage à trois. Turgenev was, had a relationship with Pauline and Louis didn't seem to mind very much, although in your book there is some doubt on that. There, just, the sources have disappeared also. But through, you have this famous writer who was crucial in, the, in, in let's say, connecting Russian writers with Europe, but they were also introducing Flaubert in Russia, etc. You had Pauline, who was a mega star all over the world, also in, in, in the Americas, etc. And through these three characters, although they're not fictional characters, but real people, it's not a novel, it's an historical book, um, you, you illustrate how this new uh, revolution that we just talked about. Uh, could you, for the writer, Turgenev, and for Pauline, the, the opera singer, could you go more into detail how this revolution changed the way that they were able to emancipate, let's say, their, uh, their, their trade? Yes, well, I mean, the reason why I chose them, or they, I think they really chose me in some ways, because I had been initially very interested in them, in particularly in the relationship between Tegain and Pauline. But the reason why they became very, uh, an, a, I think, a very effective sort of armature for the book was that they were all three cultural practitioners increasingly taking advantage of this emerging market and the technologies enabling their arts to be internationalized. So Pauline, as a touring opera star, is using the railways, 
in a um, liberating way. So already in the early 1840s, they can come to Britain, go to uh, the, the Gloucester Three Choirs Festival, and, and go home uh, to Paris before meeting their next engagement in London. So this, for a young woman with family, as well as a career to pursue, was obviously liberating. Um, and for Turgenev, um, whose uh, fame developed a little bit later, um, and who probably didn't need to make money to the same degree as Pauline, because you know he came from a landowning family and uh, and could live off his estates to a certain degree, although his estates were very badly managed, so he was probably losing more money from his estates than gaining. But um, he also was a great um, champion of copyright, as so many writers were across Europe. I mean, Dickens most famously. It, uh, Dickens was uh, famous for his battle against the Americans, because just as the Belgians were the great pirates of Europe, so the Americans were the great pirates of English literature, English language literature. Um, so Tegenev, um uh, is, is, is increasingly entrepreneurial, I believe, in, in the way he approaches the sale of his works, uh, his contracts, um, particularly when from about the 1860s onwards, um, the money for major writers like Tegenev was not in the publication of individual stories, mostly in periodicals, mm -hmm. um, but in collected works. So Tegenev is a huge uh, writer in Germany already by the 1860s, and several um, editions of his collected works mm -hmm. are there, and he's, he's, he's negotiating in a quite an entrepreneurial manner. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you mentioned at the beginning of your question the other aspect of this. The, the, one of the reasons why these three are so interesting is because they really were so well connected. I mean, in Paris, in Baden-Baden, where they settled in the 1860s, and in London, and again in Paris in the 1870s, Pauline was the hostess of a very, very influential salon, uh, where not just musicians, but also writers, statesmen, artists, politicians met. And she and Louis, who was a translator, among his many other talents, and Tegenev, played a really interesting role as sort of cultural intermediaries. So Pauline, who was of Spanish descent, her father was a very famous Spanish singer and composer. Um, she played an important role in bringing Spanish music into the European mainstream. She collected Spanish songs, the manuscripts of her father and other composers. So all of those French composers of the 1870s who started looking to Spain for inspiration, many of them were influenced by Pauline. Likewise, she and Tegenev played a really key role in getting Russian literature and music into the European mainstream just as Turgenev was important in getting French writers, particularly his closest friend Flaubert and Zola, also published in Russia. So I guess in terms of thinking about how culture is internationalized uh, in the 19th century, it's not just these economic technological factors, it's also the networks that are developed. There are two aspects I want to elaborate on, uh, you, I want you to elaborate on. Is, does this uh, opening up of borders and, and uh, uh, these contacts between these different uh, cultures, let's say, uh, led to a more mainstream uh, culture? The, the repertoire was born as well? And um, on the other hand, was it only, let's say, culture for the elite, or this this cosmopolitan that this cosmopolitan culture also uh, was uh, present in, let's say, more popular uh, um, uh, yeah, people. It, it it does, and it's the market forces driving that. So, if we take opera as an example to illustrate this, mm -hmm. before the railways, opera was a very local. Uh, basically city-based or town-based art form in which an impresario would put on a season of operas uh, 
employing a composer to write the music and rehearse the orchestra and after three performances would go off to ply his trade in another town. So Rossini was very much a trade of music. That's how he was described in his contracts. Um, and it meant that... Uh, they, they, the, they made tours as well. In Italy, they went from town to town. He would go from town to town, often rehashing his work, mm -hmm. because if he put on an opera in Bologna, then no one would know in Rome if it was the same music. So, but the important point here is that the opera audience was basically uh, limited to that town. And the money in this opera economy was based on the sale of season tickets, uh, you know, a box, typically. So to keep that opera uh, um, clientele happy, the impresario had to put on six, seven, eight different operas every year. But none of the operas really ever survived more than one season. Yeah? So if you go into the archives of, say, the Théâtre Italien in, in Paris, which is the main opera house for Italian opera, very few operas survived more than one season. I think there's only two or three before the 1830s. Um, once you have the railways bringing a bigger market for opera into the opera centers, things are completely transformed because you can sell day tickets to an audience coming not just from the provinces but internationally traveling. So your catchment area for an opera is much bigger. And that's why I think you get, at the same time as the railways, the development of grand opera. You know, opera, big five-act operas with spectacle and, you know, a show, really. It's a, show. It's a mass entertainment. And, and then the theatre managers can rely on a longer run. So the great operas of the 19th century, the great grand operas like Gounod's Faust and so on, they have five, six hundred performances. And that is because the railway is, 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 is enlarging the catchment area. And combined with that, you mentioned sheet music, it's because it, it's possible, you know, the money in an opera was not actually in the ticket sales. I mean, it, it enabled, opera's expensive, it enabled an opera, to, opera company to break even, maybe. The money in an opera was in all the derivatives. Um, it was especially in the sale of sheet music. This is a time when across Europe, everyone who can afford it is getting a piano to make music at home. And they need transcriptions uh, for uh, piano and voice, piano and violin, and the most popular of all, the forehand piano transcription. And what did they want? They wanted the tunes from the latest Bellini, Donizetti, Verdi opera. So there's um, the, a... The, was, could you hear this music in, in pubs and in the kitchens where the servants were working as well? Or were they also... Yeah, you asked whether it's popular. Absolutely. I mean, within, within days of the premiere of an opera by, say, Verdi in mid-1840s, the tunes would be being played by bands, by uh, organ grinders in the streets, um, in, in cafe concerts, in, in pubs, in music halls. So um, we now think of opera as like, you know, it's expensive and it's for the elite. But in the 19th century, opera was, it, it was popular. It doesn't mean to say everyone could afford to go to the opera, but it meant that actually um, everyone was a, probably aware of the latest Verdi hit mm -hmm. because it was easily uh, uh, disseminated through sheet music and popular performance. And in literature, is it true to say that it was through newspapers that the books were in serialized and that they become popular through that form or were the book the book itself was also was it also important uh, no the um, the newspaper and the periodical were very important forms of disseminating um, literature to the new mass readership developing uh, as a result of improvements in education in the, in the uh, and legislation in in the 1830s and 40s so Dumas Dickens 
Um, all of these very popular writers were uh, selling in periodicals first, but then um, they would I mean, the clever ones, like Balzac, for example, who was notorious in his entrepreneurial, well, some would call it greed, in terms of his negotiation with his publishers, he would um, not only sell the serial rights, but then sell it separately, you know, as a book, and then perhaps sell it to another publisher without the first one knowing. So um, there were many ways to skin a cat, as we say. There were many ways to make money out of your product, and people like Balzac, in particular, were, were very, very um, crafty and very aggressive about making the most money that they could out of it. Was it because the the countries were opening up and there was, it was much more easy to get in, into contact with art forms or cultures from abroad. Was, was there, as we always say, Europe is, is based, European unity is based on the diversity of Europe. That, I think that would be good, to, true to say. But um, you said in, in the, uh, when the first train stopped in Lille, um, there was a speech and saying, it will give our country a good opinion in Europe. So that is, let's say, a nationalist pride. Was there a competition between these, let's say, Russian artists and French and Spanish, or maybe an exotism that was going on? Or could you really talk about a more uniform European culture? Which we know well, the statesman I quoted was a Frenchman, so yeah. let's bear that in mind. But the, <laughs> the, the, and the French were a little bit behind when it came to railway building. And yeah. He was having to make a case for an international line because actually there were French statesmen saying, well, wouldn't we be invaded by foreigners? Yeah. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, the, the railways in the 1840s, 1830s, 40s and 50s, um, inspired a great deal of internationalism politically and culturally. And this was a time when, for example, the San Simonians, who were great supporters of the railways, it was an early socialist sect, they were very, you know, as were so many people in Europe behind the idea of the railways as a, a force of international brotherhood and peace. They thought that trade and the exchange of ideas would be the perfect antidote to wars and nationalism. And, and I think that um, the exchange of, I mean, obviously there was, every country was looking to express its own national um, flavor, character, and the relationship between what's national and what's European, what's national, what's international, is always there. But I think that, um, I would say before, certainly before 1848, and arguably before 1870, the, the emphasis was on, the idea that, the, the all, that all the individual nationalities could come together and form something in common. But without losing their... Without losing their character. So I've given, um, I've given one, of, one of the um, epigraphs at the beginning of the book, I think um, expresses that quite well, that, that idea. And it, it was written by uh, Théophile Torre, who was um, an art critic and writer... Um, who wrote in, in an article of 1855, when the arts of all countries with their native qualities have become accustomed to reciprocal exchanges, the character of art will be enriched everywhere to an incalculable extent, without the genius peculiar to each nation being changed. In this way, a European school would be formed in place of the national sects which still divide the great family of artists. Then a universal school familiar with the world to which nothing human will be foreign. So this was quite a commonplace, I think, by this time. So, you know, Goethe, Goethe had talked about world literature, yeah? And yeah. Marx was particularly influenced by this idea. He saw, as did Goethe, a parallel between international commodity exchange, what we would call globalization, and the development of, a, of an international culture in which the consciousness of people would be raised above national sects. 
which Marx, like Goethe, saw as narrow-minded, into something greater. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned 1870. It's a bit of a, of a change after the French-German war. Uh, you have this race of political nationalism in Europe, which culminates in the First World War in 1914, when your book ends. How did this nationalist backlash came about and the, 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 the revolution, because technology and the globalization went, went on in, also in the, in the second part of the 19th century, also with colonialism, etc. But still, this, in spite of this, this uh, globalization, nationalism took center stage after 1870-71. How, how could you explain that? Was well, um, I think the, the idea of my book is, is that there are sort of tr two trajectories running through the book. Um, the trajectory of cultural cosmopolitanism, which is brought about by the changes we've been discussing, mm -hmm. opening of borders, exchange, between countries, the creation of something supranational. And then another trajectory of more exclusive nationalism, which as you say, politically becomes dominant after 1870 really. And, but it, you know, it culminates in the First World War, which is probably the high point of cosmopolitanism. Uh, I mean, I quote, um, um, you know, uh, I mean, Stefan Zweig, for example, said it after the war that the, 1914 was, was the high point of what he called the illusion of Europe. The idea that there could be something bringing all Europeans together through culture, through values, yeah? So, I mean, that seems a paradox. You know, on the one hand, you've got the political nationalism exploding on the battlefields of Flanders and, and Poland. And on the other hand, you've got the, a cultural opening of borders and growing internationalism. And so I think the two need to be understood as trajectories that at times are working together or not necessarily are mutually exclusive and at other times are a source of friction. Mm -hmm. So, whereas I think mm, I would stress in the early 19th century, I don't think there was a great deal of friction between nationalism and cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I would, say, I would characterize German nationalism in the 1830s and 40s as being rather international. Mm -hmm. I mean, Goethe said the Germans could never unify because they're too international. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if you take Weber, the you know the the composer of Der Freischutz, often said to be the first German national opera. I mean, it's full of French influences. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but but after 1870, I think increasingly there's a a reaction against this cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. So you see it very powerfully. Um, I think particularly Where is in these France. new nation states will need to build their national culture again to, to legitimize the new I mean, power? I mean, I, I think if you look at France, for example, where, you know, around the time of the Dreyfus case, it was very, uh, very, very clear in the discourse. Because of the Bern Convention, um, there were, uh, the French book market was flooded with translations. So the, the French were suddenly going crazy over Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and then Ibsen and Strindberg and um, all sorts of um, foreign literatures were flooding the French market and the, and the French uh, conservative critics were saying, well, we're going to lose our culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a reaction against it. I mean, I think there's more to the development of nationalism in the late 19th century than just a reaction yeah. against cosmopolitanism, but I think that um, I'm just trying to illustrate that there are times when the two trajectories could be in parallel, and then there are times when the two trajectories are in opposition. Conflict, yeah. There's one aspect. If we think about uh, market-driven art and culture, we also we always have this idea that it will become uh, shallow, uh, pop, uh, commercial, like the Hollywood, like uh, uh, mainstream. Um, did that also occur in the 19th century, or is that something that was only later when 
film and radio and let's say m the mass media really exploded? Uh, uh, no, no, a great question, and it happened right from the 1830s, I think, <laughs> really. Um, the the idea that uh, um, the, the the pandering to the uh, popular appeal of the arts was to diminish the. the the, the, the elevated status that the arts should have. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think it always had, um, it had a character to it which I, I've, I'm always a bit uncomfortable about. So, the, it's seen, for example, in the movement for serious music led by music critics like Berlioz, but in particular Schumann. Um, and it always had a slightly anti-Semitic tinge to it. Um, the idea that it was, you know, uh, Maya beer was the great enemy of people like Schumann and of course famously later Wagner. O on the basis that um, it, it, they would argue uh, that, that a, a composer like Maya beer, who was the first great exponent of grand opera, um, and whose music is quite eclectic, I suppose, and popular. People loved Maya Beer because it was tuneful, easily accessible. That somehow this was reneging on the high art ideals of, of music. And it was commercial, it was just trying to make money. And so famously, Wagner attacked Maya Beer in his notorious article, Judaism in Music, where he, he just basically says of Maya Beer that it's, it's um, effects without cause, that he's just sort of embellishing his music for effect without having any real character to it. So um, there's always been, I think, this uh, uncomfortable... Um, element of nationalism and anti-Semitism at work in the way in which because the, because the profit making was associated to yeah yeah, yeah it's it's that it, it's that so um, but it's also a protest by the German tradition against the Italian tradition so you were either with the Germans or you were with the Italians so Berlioz who was very much part of this movement for serious music you know in the sense that once you'd had Beethoven and then the cult of Beethoven how can you sort of have tuneful ditties you have to have serious music because Beethoven is the god and he has spoken so Berlioz who, who, who follows the, the the cult of Beethoven obviously he takes against the Italian tradition in music very strongly mm -hmm. And, and he thinks that Meyerbeer, who changed his name to Giacomo um, and was a student, a protege of Rossini, he thinks that his Italianate qualities are part of his, you know, lack of seriousness, his commercial orientation. If you read your book, and um, could you, could we learn lessons now from what happened then? Uh, in, in the two fields. Well, well, the first, is there technological innovation now that is pushing culture to more cosmopolitanism or, vice, or not? And is there also this rise of nationalism that we're having uh, in all over the world? We, it's like we, it, your book is mirrored, what you describe here is, is mirrored in what we, we, we witness today. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, I, I um, started this book about seven years ago. Obviously, as a Brit writing it, um, you know, Brexit came in the middle of it. Um, so that put a certain urgency to my task. But I think that uh, generally in Europe, I think that, um, you know, we probably underestimate the, the f unifying force of what I'm not afraid to call European civilization. We, we underestimate the, f the, the force of our cultural heritage as produced by Europeans in particular over the last 200 years, I guess. And I think that if you look at, I mean, I think that the 19th century was a period of great cultural renaissance. And as one of my heroes, Kenneth Clark, put it, the great periods of progress in civilization, and he was, I think, in that context, talking about the Renaissance, 
and the, you know, going back to the 12th century, um, are periods of internationalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the one lesson I would want to drive home from this book, that, that really it, it is internationalism that, that is, is a force for cultural creativity. Still it's the exchange of ideas that, that it's, not, it's not the closing of cultural borders or the political urge to defend what you think is native, which it's never native anyway. I mean, the, part of the Brexit movement is to try and defend what the Brexiteers call, you know, the sort of Englishness of English culture, mm -hmm. the exceptionalism of English. And I say specifically English because it's English nationalism driving. Brexit, not the Scots or, the, mm -hmm. or anybody else. But in uh, your book you, you say that also in the 19th century Great Britain uh, took the, a more insular position towards this uh, European uh, the, culture. They, they, the Brits, they, 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 they considered it Brit the Britons were superior to, the, to the, the French or the German culture. Yeah, the Brits were, I mean the Brits were the first great tourists really. I mean in the sense that they were very wealthy and they were the first really to take advantage of uh, railway international travel on the continent. So which is why you have Hotel d'Angleterre, Hotel de Londres everywhere throughout Europe. And, and yet they traveled with a sort of air of moral superiority. Mm -hmm. um, they, they had that, uh, they hopeless at languages and, and tended to think as they still They colonized do, the rest of the world, they wanted to yeah, colonize so Europe. They sort of thought that if they spoke to some Florentine merchant loudly enough in English and slowly enough, in, I will have uh, one of those please, they should understand and of course they didn't understand. But they, they, they traveled with this and also had this sense of the, um, the sort of the Britain was somehow different because of its island culture, because of its um, different traditions of law, because of its um, liberties, because it had never been conquered, because it had its empire and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So they tended to be insular in their outlook. Mm -hmm. um, but my argument would be, and I would repeat it to the Brexiteers today, that actually British culture was and remains more European than they themselves like to think. Mm -hmm. There's, if you talk, you said I would, uh, I'm not, uh, I will use the word uh, European civilization. It's become very, um, uh, we had, it was in the news this day because the European Commission is, is uh, naming a commissioner who wants to, to, um, to guard over European culture and, and values. It's it's a problematic term in in today uh, because it's Europe has been imperialist for two hundred for three hundred years or maybe more from from the, the discovery of America um, after the the Second World War there was a first wave of decolonization which is still going on in our minds and also politically uh, Europe cannot retain this let's say cosmopolitan, um, uh, I must say, uh, way of, 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 of affirming itself in the world with, uh, with the naivete that it had before. It's, it's, how, uh, if you use the word European civilization, how, how, has, how should it be considered today? Because in the 19th century it was, it was simple, it was this, from this position of superiority that Europe could say we are Europe, we are European culture. But I think we can accept that there are civilizations in the plural, right? So there are, there are, uh, there are civilizations in Africa, in Asia, wherever you look, there are civilizations. And I don't see why we shouldn't uh, take pride in European civilization. Not in this uh, sense of superiority or, in, or, or imperialism or, or, or wanting to dictate what values should be. We don't, we're not in the enlightenment of the 18th century anymore. Um, we all believe in pluralism. And, but nonetheless, I don't think we should be ashamed of European civilization, which I think is, I mean, I'm an old-fashioned, very politically incorrect, old, practically dead white man. So um, maybe my views don't count so much any, anymore, but I do feel that, um, that there is a tendency in the sort of movement for political correctness to be ashamed of, of European if we, if uh, civilization. And I don't see why we need be, because actually it's been a very liberating force as a sort of 
base position for cultures around the world. So you, um, it, 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 and a liberating force. If you say that uh, new technologies like the railroad made this cosmopolitan European culture possible, we're living now in the internet age, which is also yeah. a means of communication, ideas and also cultural books and, and everything we produce it can be digitalized. Yes. Are we at the brink of a worldwide globalization of culture? Well, I don't think we're on the brink of it. I think we're in it, yes. No. Um, and coming back to the excellent question you put before about lessons from mm -hmm. this history, I think that you mentioned digitization. I mean, if the great achievement, if the great legal intellectual achievement of the 19th century was the establishment of international copyright, then I think with digitization, we are now entering possibly a post-copyright age. We're entering an age when it's becoming increasingly difficult for artists, writers, for, in, for people who are creating things in intellectual property to enforce their property, to earn from it, because piracy on the internet is everywhere. Um, and because everyone expects everything on the internet to be free. Um, so it's very difficult to make money out of intellectual creations. And perhaps we need to... I mean, I think that the, the 19th century, in particular the, the period of the creation of international law for copyright protection, is a very useful period to look back to in order to think, well, where do we go from here? What lessons can we learn in the post sort of, or near post copyright age about how you can enforce intellectual property? Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I mean, I think... Do you have any suggestions? No, I don't. I mean, I, th <laughs> I think that this new EU law, or this new, the, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the article. Um, is it Article 24? I can't remember. The new EU directive about um, copyright on um, on the internet is is moving in the right direction, but I'm I'm not quite sure whether it's enforceable. I think we'll we'll have to work out. But I think it's um, it it is a challenge because I think what's happening in the, in the arts is that certainly in 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 literature is that if you, you know, that it's, we're moving very quickly towards um, a period when, you know, unless you're a bestseller or a celebrity, which makes, you, makes it possible for you to become a bestseller, it's very difficult to make money out of books anymore. Very difficult. Partly because people aren't reading, but partly also because actually if you publish something, it's going to be pirated as soon as you can print it. And... Uh, so I think we need to, um, you know, there needs, we, we need more thought about how we're going to enforce that. Okay. Uh, I promised, no, I didn't promise, but I will promise it now, uh, that I would give the opportunity to the audience to ask uh, Orlando a few questions. Um, now is the moment. Yeah, there is a microphone coming your way. Hello, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I first heard of you because of your book, A People's Tragedy, which was in my university curriculum. And when I saw that you were coming to Brussels, I thought I, had to, I have to go. Um, uh, and I also heard the podcast you had with BBC uh, History Extra, where you talked about Russia and Spain, which is where Pauline Viado was from, yes. as these kind of peripheries of Europe, and talked a little bit about the role that they played in the shaping of European uh, culture. So my question, is, well, I have two questions. One is, uh, what, if any, role did Portugal play? Um, and if you could answer that. And the other is, uh, I see that you have a velvet, uh, velvet, the red velvet front cover of your book. Yeah. Could you just explain where that idea came from? The, well, that's not my idea, it's the publisher's idea. Uh, um, but it is the curtain of the Palais Garnier, the uh, Paris Opera. Um, so yeah, it makes a it makes a nice um, makes a nice cover, I think. Yeah, um, a great question about Spain and P Portugal. I'm afraid, yeah, uh, my knowledge of Portugal and Portuguese history and culture is is minuscule. I'm afraid, but um, 
The, but I think it probably can be put together with Spain as an Iberian peninsula whose um, who's, uh, who's cultural practices as consumers certainly was integrated into France quite strongly. So I would imagine that in Portugal, just as in Spain, a large proportion of the literature is actually translated um, from, from France. But more generally, on the producer's side, I think the point I was making in that podcast, and which I would make in the book, and one of the other reasons why Turgenev and Viado Garcia are such useful sort of vehicles for my argument, is that they were, at the beginning, both Spain and Russia, peripheral countries, in the sense that both were seen by the French in particular as an Orient, Europe's Orient. Yeah? So it wasn't that the Orient was Persia or something like that. It was that Spain, because of the Moors, was the Orient. And Russia, because of the Mongols, was, was the Orient. So it, was not, it was, wasn't really regarded as part of Europe, either, in either case, despite their, in particular in Spain, the ancient civilization of the Spanish. So, um, so they were seen then first as by the Romantics, obviously, both in Russia, and particularly in the Spanish case, as exotic, yeah? So the people went to, tra to travel, in particular the French post-Napoleonic Wars, traveling to Spain and saw it and wrote all these memoirs as Louis Viardot did, um, as a sort of place of exotic appeal. But because of the cultural interchanges I describe in the book and the efforts of people like Viardot and, and, and Turgenev, I, I, my argument would be that by the end of the 19th century, they are very much part of the mainstream. Yeah? So that um, they're not expected to be exotic anymore. So that, I mean, sure, you can, Diaghilev can bring Russian culture to Paris in the 1900s, and he's selling it because it's exotic. But equally, Tchaikovsky is popular in, in the mainstream European sphere, and, and he's not really exotically Russian at all, is he? I mean, he's pretty Germanic, really, in his, Beethoven even, in his musical composition. So, um, so that would be my argument, that actually, the concept of Europe is spreading. I mean, the, the, the geographical identification of what is Europe culturally is, is, is being enlarged. So that whereas at the beginning of the 19th century, I think most people who are, you know, in Paris or London or Berlin or Vienna or Milan would have seen um, the center of Europe being most definitely Paris and being, you know, the real Europe being Northwest Europe and everywhere else being semi-Oriental. By the end of the 19th century, I think the concept of what is Europe is much larger. Okay, maybe one thing you, you, you said in the book was relevant for Brussels as well, that the railway, the railroads, uh, the connections between France and Brussels brought about enormous changes here in Brussels as well. Absolutely. You, you, you absolutely. name staggering figures of 20,000 yeah. French people coming to live here in Brussels and taking, basically well, taking over the city. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Brussels pre the railways was a sort of provincial Brabant town, monolingual, uh, and because of the railways became a, an important cosmopolitan center, a crossroads of French and German cultures, but also Flemish and even English cultures. And as you say, I think in the first decade of r the railways uh, coming to Brussels, 20,000 French moved to Brussels. More came because of political reasons. And they were immediately the cultural elites of Brussels. Yeah. Um, and um, which puts also a stress on the linguistic I'm sure. uh, problems I'm sure. we always have in this country. Okay. I'm sure, yeah. but it but it meant that Brussels in the late 19th century was a real hub of um, cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. So that I mean we know that the French were very resistant to Wagner, right? Because 
opposed Franco-Prussian war. They didn't want anything to do with Which Wagner. Was, yeah, yeah. But Brussels was a conduit for Wagner into France. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you have Rodin here was a major figure in Brussels, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you had other art. I mean, you, have, you obviously had Victor Hugo here mm -hmm. in the 1860s. So, so because of the railways, Brussels is a very good example of a town transformed from a national, not even 18, free 1830, a national centre, a provincial city into a cosmopolitan one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. More questions? Yeah. Yep. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could say a bit more about how the growing interconnection of technology and culture and ideas uh, influence politics. And I'm thinking of moments like uh, the 1848 revolutions and what role did this development do in encouraging the spread of these kind of events? That's a very good question. I mean, if you think about the 1848 revolutions, what is obviously remarkable about them is how quickly they spread. Or, I mean, you can explain that, I think, in two ways. Firstly, they, there were similar ideas emerging everywhere, yeah? Similar ideas about liberty, about national liberation, and so on. But I think the ideas also spread very quickly because of the technologies, because you could very quickly print broadsheets. You already had telegraphs, you had railways. So, I mean, famously, I mentioned, you know, um, Wagner. I mean, the, 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 the revolutionaries, in some cases, uh, as in the Dresden uprising, uh, moved from one city to another. So, um, I think that 1848 is the first sort of example of a pan-European revolution. Um, and just as perhaps, if you like, in the Arab Spring, it was social media enabling things to spread so quickly across the Maghreb. So in 1848, I think it was the new print technologies, the railways, the telegraphs, that enabled ideas to spread so quickly. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a... It's, I think it's difficult for us now to see that, I think, I mean, or to appreciate how transformative it was. Um, because um, we, we take the railways for granted. But I think in its time, the railways were as transformative as the internet is for, for, for us now. It was that it, radical, the idea that you could get from, you know, uh, Magdeburg to Berlin in a few hours was unthought of before. So ideas are spreading much, much quicker than before. Okay. Thank you, and thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. This is my first exposure to your, your work, so I might have some holes in my understanding, but um, my kind of point of interest in the conversation was when you were talking about kind of this uh, European school um, in place of national sects and then this opportunity then for kind of universalism to emerge and when also you were uh, questioning really can we retain this cosmopolitan kind of way of understanding um, ourselves and um, I'm, I'm interested in this too related to Brexit and, and class as well because I went to um, a labor studies conference recently in the UK and I came to an understanding actually that my own kind of cosmopolitan identity um, is also kind of a privileged position in some ways in that um, you need a certain, res certain resources and opportunities in order to access that state of being and to have those cultural references. So I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on, on that and, and what you think of that today in the current uh, political moment. Uh, you said it's a, uh, a privileged position, did you say? I didn't quite catch it because of the sound. But yeah. I reckon that you must have meant privileged. Yeah? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, no, I guess that's right. And I guess um, you could level the criticism of my uh, book that, uh, that, that I'm sort of assuming more people felt this cosmopolitanism than, um, than I, uh, less people felt it than I'm assuming 
uh, by claiming its significance at the time. Um, and sure, of course, in uh, provincial towns, in uh, working class districts of cities, um, peasant labourers would not have felt necessarily an internationalism, obviously. Um, but I, that's not my point, really. I, mean, I guess my point is that it's, it's the possibility of that. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the fact that there aren't any m more closures on what is open to people. It's the fact that if you only have a branch line of a railway, you can still get on a train from your local station and be anywhere. That is a tremendously progressive force, it seems to me, which obviously will only trickle down to certain privileged people. But, um, but that in itself is, it, it seems to me, highly significant. Um, and, um, you know, when we think of, um, when we think of today, you know, Trumpism, I'm sure that most people who voted for Trump have never been out of the United States. When we think of the people who voted for Brexit, I should imagine that other than, you know, the British holiday to Benidorm or somewhere in a package holiday, I sorry, I don't want to be too much of a snob, but I'm, I'm old enough not to care. Um, the, you know, other than the sort of um, holiday uh, to, to Spain on a package, I don't think that they probably have traveled that much in Europe either. And so maybe they are more susceptible to a nationalist argument. But I think what's been remarkable about, I mean, there's a lot of younger people here. What's remarkable about, about the generation that you certainly have been part of, and which, um, you know, the British have benefited so much from in terms of British membership of the EU, the freedom to travel and work anywhere in Europe. The, these freedoms have produced what I think is actually not a privileged position. I think it's a position that for your generation, you have every right, everybody in your generation, to assume that as a right, not as a privilege. And, and that is actually what has been behind the strength of Europe in the last uh, two generations. The fact that you can be uh, Belgian, Italian, French and come and work in London, vice versa. That's, that, that's not privilege. That's actually the product of things that, for me, began in the 19th century. The four freedoms are all inventions of the 19th century. Okay, there is a lot of noise, so I think we will have to end uh, here. Orlando, I will thank you very much for being here. Uh, you, you can also get uh, your copy of his book in English and in Dutch, because there is a new Dutch translation also uh, available uh, nowadays. Um, uh, before I leave, I will point your attention to the fact that in, at 18.30 or half past six, we will have a discussion on African art as philosophy here in this same room. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.